Namaste and good morning, everyone. Welcome to this Wednesday's class. Let's start the class with some prayers. Om Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo, Maheshwaraha, Guru Sakshat Parbrahma, Tasme Shri Guru Venama, Om Bhur Bhavaswa, Tatsavitra Vare Neyam, Bargo Deva Sedhi Mahi, Diyo Yonaha Prachodaya, Asto Ma Sadgamya, Tamso Ma Jyotir Gamya, Mrityur Ma Amritam Gamya, Om Sehna Bhavtu, Sehna Bhunaktu, Sehviryam Karvahvai, Tejasvi Navadhi Tamastu, Ma Vidvi Shavahi, Om Shanti 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 Om. I'm sure most of you know the real name of India. Right? Bharat. Bharat Varsha. That is the name. And I'm sure you know the meaning of Bharat also. Bha means light. Rat means someone who is devoted. So what is this light? This light means the illumination or the highest human perfection. Or you can call it search for the eternal truth. So the people who lived there over the centuries, we call them Rishis and the Munis, they devoted their entire life in the search of this truth, this light. That's why the name of that place is Bharat, Bharat Varsha. It's not really India. And I am glad that more and more people are using the actual name these days. Bharat Varsha. We are familiar with some of the philosophies which came from there. And some of the very inspired discoveries of the Rishis. Ancient Rishis like Bhrigu, Vashisht, Yagvalke, their remarkable wisdom was collected in Sanskrit scriptures called Upanishads. Main Upanishads are found at the very end of each of the four sacred scriptures called Vedas. Towards the end. That's why this Upanishads, another name for the Upanishads is Vedanta also. See, there's a Vedanta philosophy, but Upanishads are called Vedanta. So it is a body of wisdom. All those Upanishads. Vedanta is based not only on the Upanishads, but also on the famous Bhagavad Gita. And on a highly analytical text, the Brahma Sutras also. But the problem is that all of these scriptures are subject to being interpreted in various ways. Even Bhagavad Gita. In the 8th century, there lived a young spiritual genius from Kerala. by the name of Shankara. Later on, he was known as Adi Shankara or Shankracharya. Between the time frame of 700 to 750 CE, he interpreted those scriptures according to the strictly non-dual point of view. And another term for that is Advaita. Dvait means two, Advait means one. Then in the 11th century, 
1,077 to 1,157 CE, there came another genius by the name of Ramanujya. He was a free thinker, somewhat rebellious, but he was a spiritual teacher from Tamil Nadu. He completely rejected Shankaracharya's interpretation of the scriptures as being far too extreme, too radical. So he reinterpreted the scriptures according to his own perspective, a perspective known as qualified non-dualism or Vishisht Advaita. Later yet, in the 13th century, the exact time is 1238 through 1317 CE. There came Madhav, and later on, he is known as Madhvacharya, who was a pious monk from Karnataka. And he rejected the philosophical complex interpretation of both Shankaracharya and Ramanucharya. And instead, he advocated a simpler interpretation of the scriptures, an interpretation based on dualism, the Veda. So each of these great scholars wrote elaborate Sanskrit commentaries <coughs> on the Upanishads, on Bhagavad Gita and on the Brahma Sutras. Even today you can find these commentaries based on their writings. In those commentaries, they each firmly established their own interpretation and thoroughly refuted the interpretation of others. Today I want to briefly touch upon the main differences between their perspective. They, all three of them were great scholars. Let's look at, uh, first of all, Shankaracharya. He taught that Brahma, the underlying reality, because of which everything exists, has no attributes, which is called nirguna, or qualities whatsoever. Brahm is an absolute transcendental reality. Beyond the world, beyond all creatures, and even beyond Ishwar, God, who created all this. That's called Brahm. According to Shankaracharyaji, the world is not as real as Brahma. It is Mithya. Unreal. Mithya. Consisting merely of names and forms. Several places he gave the analogy of a pot. He said like a pot that's merely a name and form of clay. He taught that Atma, the true inner self, is utterly non-separate from Brahma. And when this truth goes unrecognized due to ignorance, you become subject to suffering. And he said, liberation is gained by discovering that Atma is not separate from Brahma. He said that is liberation. And this knowledge puts an end to all suffering, both in this lifetime and thereafter. So just to summarize, according to Shankaracharya ji, ultimate reality is nirguna. So Brahm is nirguna, no attributes. 
this world, the jagat which we see is mithya. The self, the atma, is non-separate from Brahma, which is called a bed. There's no difference. And then liberation or moksha is through jnana, the knowledge. So this is, a, in summary, what Shankaracharya Ji, when you try to study his commentaries, keep this in mind. And this is called a non-dualism advaita. Now let's look at it briefly according to Ramanucharya. He said the ultimate reality is Brahma, but as Lord Vishnu, who possesses limitless power and infinite divine attributes. Attributes like being creator of the world, source of the blessings. Ramanuja considers the world to be as real as Lord Vishnu. The world is a material or a physical aspect of Lord Vishnu. His physical body, so to speak. For Ramanuja, the inner self of each person is a tiny part of Lord Vishnu's infinite divine being. Atma is like a little glowing spark emitted by a huge blazing fire. And how do we get liberation? Liberation is gained by surrendering to Lord Vishnu and reaching him after death. So to summarize, this Vashisht Advaita or qualified non-dualism, ultimate reality is with attributes, Sagun. World is real, Satyam. Self is Ansh or a part and liberation is through surrender. Okay? So just remember the key differences. And now let's look at the dvet or the dualism. <clears throat> According to Madhvacharya Ji, the ultimate reality is Lord Vishnu as a personal God who is separate from the world and its beings. Madhvacharya ji famously taught five kinds of separateness or differences. Difference between soul and God. Difference between soul and soul also he talks about. Difference between soul and matter. Difference between God and matter. Difference between one material thing and the another. So five main differences. So if you want to summarize it, difference between material things and Atma and soul. Difference between material things and Lord Vishnu. Difference between individual souls and Lord. For Madhvacharya, liberation is gained through intense devotion. Devotion that invokes Lord Vishnu's grace and saves you from suffering in one life after another. So to summarize Madhvacharya Ji, ultimate reality, personal God, Vishnu. World is separate, Bhed. Self is separate, Bhed. Liberation is through grace. Another term for anu grace is Anugraha. Anugraha. So these are like a main differences. So there's a lot of information. Let me make it a bit easier to grasp. Very simple way to visualize that these three different perspectives. In Advaita, 
philosophy, Brahm alone exists. All else is merely names and forms. That's Advaita. In Vashisht Advaita, Lord Vishnu exists along with the material world and individual souls. All of which are part or aspects of Lord Vishnu, parts that are not separate from him. Okay. And then in Dveta Vedanta, Lord Vishnu exists along with the material world and individual souls, all of which are completely separate or different from each other and from Lord Vishnu also. So these are like a key differences between these three philosophies. Now this comparison is extremely brief, the last part which I told you. It omits many important details about all three teachings. Not only that, it completely omits several other kinds of philosophies. Because as I told you, the land of Bharat, the rishis, the philosophers, they were encouraged to think, move towards that ultimate reality. So there are a lot of other interpretations also. The scriptures have been interpreted by Yadav Prakash, Nimbarak, Vallabha, and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Those are other some of the other known philosophers. Yadav Prakash in the 10th century, he came up with a Ved a Ved philosophy. Nimbarik in 13th century came with the Dvayat Advayat philosophy. And then Vallabh or Vallabhacharya in 16th century, Shuddh Advayat. And then in 16th century, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, his philosophy is called Achinti Bhed Abhed philosophy. And there are many, many others also. But today, the purpose is to just in these three philosophies, we got to look at it. Because over the centuries, there has been many divisiveness among the followers. And we know that divisiveness of any kind can be harmful. Divisiveness between racial, social, religious groups has led to terrible problems in the world. Problems like discrimination, terrorism, and war. Divisiveness between liberals and conservatives here in this country, United States, we can see it has weakened our social fabric and even threatens to destroy the unity of this great nation. So the divisiveness among the followers of Shankaracharya Ji, Ramanujacharya, Madhavacharya, when these followers don't understand properly, they definitely become very combative. These great scholars, they recognized a very central principle of Hinduism. Central principle Hinduism is a freedom. Hinduism allows us to worship any form of God, any form you choose. It allows us to worship God in many ways, with or without a particular form, in a temple or in our own home on the altar. We can choose a sacrificial fire. We can even choose the nature. 
So Hindu tradition acknowledges that every person is different and has different religious preferences and different spiritual needs. So that is the central principle which these scholars recognized. And this principle is called Adhikari Bhed. That means the difference between Adhikaris. Difference between the spiritual seekers. But now, in the modern world, many religious organizations discourage and prohibit their members from exploring teachings that lie outside their beliefs. But in the ancient time, centuries ago, they encouraged. Because that's how you find the reality. And that's why so many different uh, philosophies are out there. Sometimes we find that great teachers, truly great teachers, criticizing others' point of view also. But their goal was not to be divisive or to condemn others. Nor is it intellectually restrain their students or keep them from leaving. They did not care for that. In fact, their goal was to teach with a much clarity as much as possible and ultimately give the freedom to the students. Reconciling these three perspectives, let's look at this story which is often quoted. This is a story about three sadhus. Three monks who were trained in the lineage of Madhvacharya, Ramanujacharya, and Shankaracharya, respectively. One day they went to the seashore. Standing in the sand, the first sadhu, who was a follower of Madhvacharya, said to the others, Look at the vast ocean. See how. Every wave is born from the ocean. Sustained by the ocean and eventually returns to the ocean. That's how Madhvacharya described the relationship between individual souls and Lord Vishnu, he said. And see how each wave is different from all the others and different from the ocean itself. That's like Madhvacharya's famous doctrine of difference, he said. Bhed. And see how waves depend on the ocean for their existence. But the ocean exists independent of the waves. That's like Madhva's teachings, that every soul depends on Lord Vishnu for its existence. But the Lord himself is independent of his creation. The other two sadhus, they listened carefully. Then the second sadhu, a follower of Ramanujacharya, described the ocean quite differently. Same ocean, different description. He said, I understand your perspective. But as you can see, every single wave is a small part of the ocean. The vast ocean possesses countless waves, just like Lord Vishnu possesses countless divine attributes. As Ramanujacharya said, and each wave is a tiny part of the vast ocean, just like each soul is a tiny spark of Lord Vishnu's infinite divinity. All the waves are attributes or aspects of the ocean. Just like the world and souls are all various aspects of Lord Vishnu. As our teacher taught us. After a long pause, the third sadhu, a follower of Shankaracharya ji, 
said to the other son. He said, whatever you said doesn't make any sense to me. They said, what? He said, don't you see all the waves? He said, what waves are you talking about? Don't you see the ocean, they said? He said, what ocean? Then they asked him, what do you see? He said, water. He said, I see only water. There's a water alone. Just like Shankaracharya Ji said, that all that exists is Brahm alone. He said, the waves are also water. The ocean is water. I don't see any difference. After that, the three sadhus on the beach went on arguing late in the night. Who do you think won the argument? None of them. Each sadhu was right from his own perspective. All three explanations, points of view, they were correct. The way they were trained, the way they thought. Arguing about which is right or wrong ends up being counterproductive. As long as the sadhus continued to argue, they couldn't enjoy the beauty of the vast ocean. And same is true for arguments about Advaita, Vashishta, Advaita and Dvaita. Each of these three can be considered correct from its own point of view. Arguing about them only entangles our mind in a web of words and logics that ultimately prevent us from appreciating the beauty of the absolute reality. Among these three teachings, as I gave you the dates, Advaita came first historically. Shankaracharya Jis. Followed by the Vishisht Advaita and later yet by Dvaita. Seems like Advaita accurately represents the overall intent of the Upanishads. When you take the scriptures as a whole, their main focus really seems to be Advaita. But as we know, we study Upanishads also. The teachings of the Advaita are extremely lofty and can be very difficult to grasp. That's why these teachings remained beyond the reach of many sincere spiritual seekers. Now consider this. The goal of every teacher is not just to teach. The goal is to teach in a way that's helpful to the students. A teacher who's teaching a kindergartner has a high degree too. Will teach differently to a kindergartner than to teach in the university. So teachers teach according to the students also what they can grasp. I can imagine teachers long ago struggling to convey the highest, most elusive teaching of Advaita and completely failing to make their students understand. Some teachers would probably try to make their teachings more accessible and easier for their students to grasp. 
and they might have modified or revised their teachings, creating what's now known as Vashishta Dvaita. But then even Vashishta Dvaita could be too difficult for some students to fully comprehend. So later teachers might have simplified it even further, creating the teachings which we now call the Veda. By saying all this, I don't mean to suggest that Advaita is superior to the other two. Or that Dvaita is inferior in any way. I don't want you to take that from this. Just like it will be ridiculous to suggest that calculus is superior to algebra. Or the multiplication is inferior to them both. These are different subject matters. Each subject matter is intended to meet the needs of different students. And that brings us back to the important principle of Adhikari Bhed. So Advaita, Vishisht Advaita and Dvaita can be understood as being intended for three different groups of seekers. Each is meant to meet the spiritual needs of all those who can fully comprehend and benefit its teachings. But none of this suggests that one teaching is better than another. Okay, remember this. Because that's what be becomes the problem. When without recognizing or reaching to the goal, the ego just burst up that I believe in the Advait philosophy. Or I'm a student of such and such guru. To be a student of a great guru does not make us great. We will become great only when we follow the teachings and reach to the goal. Remember that. Otherwise, we are wasting our time just like those three sadhus did. After all, the ultimate purpose of all these teachings, not only these three teachings, but the other teachings also, is not to impart philosophical or spiritual principles. That's not the ultimate goal. Their purpose is to address the problem of human suffering. And all three can most certainly bless their followers with the tremendous spiritual growth and inner peace. We got to see that the path we are walking on, is it taking me closer to that inner peace or not? Any given time, is my mind completely restful or not? Wherever I go, can I take that light, my inner light, spread that light? Or not? These are the questions we have to ask. Because ultimately, we are the bringer of that light. We got to create the illumination within us and around us. So I just wanted to go through some basic differences of these three main philosophies and uh, remind you that uh, what the purpose of uh, this beautiful human life is. So let's end it here and we can go through some discussion if you like. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadai Purnameva Visheshyate Om Shanti 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 Om Thank you very much.